Databases. A database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. So I'm very excited today to have Ben Hannell uh, from Rockset come talk about Rockset, which is super awesome. Uh, so Ben did his undergrad and master's both at Stanford in computer science, and then he's been at Rockset since uh, 2019, so over three years now. So one of my best students, Yash, went through Rockset, and so we were happy to uh, invite you guys back and give give another talk. So Ben, the floor is yours. Again, for the audience, if, if you have any questions for Ben who's given the talk, please admit yourself, say who you are, and fire away at any time. Let this be a conversation and not just have Ben talking to himself for Zoom for, for an hour. So Ben, go for it. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me, Andy. Uh, it's really excited to give the talk. So I'll be talking about a few aspects of Rockset today, one of which is how we get high performance despite being dynamically typed and schemaless. And I'll be diving into some interesting aspects of how we index data. So I know you've seen a lot of data set, databases here, so I'm going to focus on what makes Rockset different from most other systems. Um, we're schemaless and dynamically typed. Every document in Rockset can have a different set of, of columns. It can have nested data where you have objects and arrays inside each other. Um, it can have columns or fields of mixed types. So despite supporting full SQL, it looks a lot like a document store in terms of what kind of data you can put into it. Rockset also indexes everything. So no manual configuration of which fields to index and of what type will index all of your fields and all of your nested data by default. We also support uh, real-time data, real-time ingest. So when you do a write, it's visible within seconds and real-time queries, um, being able to handle like operational queries with latencies in the tens or hundreds of milliseconds. So before I dive into how we build a schemaless database, I want to dive into why. Why is that useful? Why is that something that people would want? There are all the traditional arguments you get from people building document stores, um, folks like MongoDB, DynamoDB, uh, advantages where you don't have to manage a schema, uh, adding columns whenever your application needs change. Um, it also means that if you have some kind of pipeline to get data into your data database. If you want to use a more traditional relational database to analyze data from the real world, you're going to need an ETL, like an extract, transform, load pipeline first. If your database is more flexible, then you can either do that transformation in SQL, which is easier than doing it before you hit the database, or you might not even need to do it at all. That's often the case, that Roxit is sufficiently performant that you can just take data as it comes with whatever denormalization, nesting, um, and then run queries on it directly. Now, on top of that, uh, there's an advantage to being schemaless in that you can interact easily with all these other schemaless systems. So Rockset can ingest data from uh, a traditional OLTP database with a schema, but it can also take data from a NoSQL document store, uh, data streams with like JSON strings coming through Kafka, uh, data links if you've got like JSON or CSV and S3. It can ingest all of these sources, mirror them in real time by either like continuously watching the data lakes or by ingesting a CDC stream from NoSQL or OLTP sources and keep data on in Rockset in sync with the original source. Everything making sense so far? And then you get fast SQL on multiple sources um, basically joined together so that you can combine different sources of information into one place where you can analyze and then build applications on top of it. All right, that, that rocket ship, is that Kafka's K-SQL thing or is this just a Rockset thing? I think this this is something in our like slide deck uh, default. Okay. So I don't think we took it from anywhere. I think this is okay. our rocket ship. No, no, I mean, I mean there's a, sorry, it, there's, the Kafka guys use a similar rocket ship for K-SQL. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I hope we didn't accidentally copy paste Basta the Kafka uh, SQL rocket. All right, so that's why you want schemaless dynamically typed data. Why is that hard to build? What are some of the interesting challenges? Um, to explain how Rockset approaches getting good performance on dynamically typed data, um, a little bit of background on what a vectorized execution engine is and why Rockset uses it. Common technique in databases, I bet a lot of people have heard of it. Um, to amortize away the interpretation overhead of doing an, an operation from your query, you will operate on back, batches of data at a time instead of individual scalars. Um, 
So you don't want to have to like trace over the AST of your query for every single tuple in your input. Um, instead, you trace over the AST saying like, oh, we're doing an addition. We can add this like column of 4,000 ints to this column of 4,000 ints and do that interpretation overhead once. And then your inner loop is really tight. So Rockset has a columnar vectorized execution engine. And the nice advantage of that is that not only can you use it to amortize away the interpretation overhead of interpreting the AST of the query, um, you can also leverage it to amortize away the overhead of dynamic typing. So think about like a column in a uh, strongly typed or a, a column in a statically typed database will be all of one type. Um, so you can have a representation that's like eight bytes or four bytes for each of these integers, um, and your loops just look like iterating over an array of integers. A naive implementation of a dynamically typed database might look something like this, where you have each tuple has some tagged type where you have a, a, an indicator of what type it is, and then some value, which will be in a different format depending on the type. Um, the performance for this kind of in-memory data representation wouldn't be great because for every single input tuple, you're going to be uh, dispatching on what type it is. So you'll have a branch in your inner loop. You're using all this extra space for your tags. So this isn't going to be a very compact memory layout, um, not a very performant representation. But in practice, even when you give people the ability to use dynamic typing, typically there is inner schema to the data. Um, any given block of data is probably going to be all of one type. Um, so within a, a columnar block, which I think is 4K by default, if it all is of the same type, then we will get this compact representation where there's one tag on the whole array um, and then individual values uh, that are compactly encoded with a homogeneous representation. We use this on disk for more compact storage. Um, we use it in memory so we can process over it without dispatching over the type. And we send it over the network like this uh, so that we use less network bandwidth. Of course, if a user actually has mixed types, they have every other document's an int versus a string, then you'll get the heterogeneous representation with uh, a bit of a performance overhead to that. So how often does that happen? Um, in practice, it's relatively rare to see mixed types. The type of mixed type you do see fairly often is uh, like a one type and then null, which we have a special case for that actually is an extension of the homogeneous format. Mm -hmm. And if you do have some sort of mixed types like ints and floats, we have ways to coerce to one or the other at ingest time so you can get the homogeneous advantages. This also happens over the course of a query. So if you read heterogeneous format from disk and then cast, cast it, the output of the cast will become homogeneous. So everything upstream of that will get the benefits. What about like if, if so presumably you're keeping track within like, I don't know, like a, like a, a key value pair or an array that most of the time it's, you know, you expect to see a float. And then all of a sudden you see a string, will you fix it for them and cast it to a, to a float right there? Or you just take it as is? Uh, like, we don't think perform it. We preserve the exact semantics of the data as the user gives it to us. So if they put a string into their data set, we will keep it as a string. And if they query it, they will get it out as a string. We're not going to do any any magic conversions in the background. Yeah, even though even though people are if they, how is it? if they're stupid and wrong, you can I mean I guess you just let them be stupid and wrong, right? Our approach is generally like let the user know they're being stupid and wrong, give them some kind of warning, some kind of error that they're doing something on types that they really shouldn't be. Um, but we find like silently converting generally causes more confusion in the long run. Okay, thanks. Yeah, really good question. Users have a larger set of ways to shoot themselves in the foot when you give them dynamic typing. Type systems can, can be a blessing at times, but their advantage is getting the flexibility. Okay. Um, so now we have many different homogeneous representations for many different types. I'm showing two here, but we actually have something like 16 types, uh, uh, 16 primitive types. We've got timestamps, date times, dates, um, wider integer types, a lot of really interesting stuff. And then you need code that's generic. Other oh, questions in chat. Um, will users have JSON type in the schema? How do you handle? Chi, you want to ask your question? Yeah. So uh, basically, I um I think Rockset maybe supports some schemaless ingest string. So if user just give you a JSON column, will you do some optimization when you ingest the data and convert it to some homogeneous representation, or you just store the JSON as string inside um, Rockset and during the computation? So that's a really interesting question. Um, 
it gets to something that a lot of other databases, at least in Rockset opinion, have done wrong. They have JSON as a type in their database, where you have a column of integers, a column of floats, and a column of JSON. That approach doesn't work very well, because now you have this column with this weird type that doesn't act like any other types that you can't really index properly. And even if you can, you're going to require weird custom extensions of the language to make it work. What Rockset says is our notion of document is a superset of JSON. So like you can ingest, um, if you want to take an object, like parse from a JSON object and say that's a column in a rock set, we will not just be able to store that and represent it fully, we will uh, shred it and index it all the way down, all the way to the leaves of that JSON object. Even if there are arrays, we'll index into the arrays. Um, there's not going to be, we're not shoehorning JSON into one corner of one type. Rockset is expressive enough to store JSON as yeah. its document. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does make sense. I think I'll have later examples that will clear it up even more. Um, let's see. Oh, I was saying, we have many different homogeneous types for and all the types in rocks, and we want to write generic code that operates on it, but without paying the dispatch overhead in the inner loop of saying, okay, what type are we operating on right now? We do that using C++ templates. So I'm going to show this as an, a, a code example, because I think that's the clearest way to understand. Um, say we want to write a function where we're saying, okay, if I duplicate the last element in some array of some type, we don't know what type yet, how many bytes of memory will that use? So I value is the dynamic type that we use as a holder for all of these different homogeneous and heterogeneous array types. Um, think of it as a tag and then some heap allocated data to say like that word that the tag is telling you how to interpret. So the first thing we do is we invoke this dispatch function, array type dispatch, where we give it this dynamically typed I value. And then we pass it a closure that we want to execute on this dynamically typed I value. Following so far? So here's where things get interesting. The closure doesn't take an I value as a parameter. It takes auto, which basically means an inferred templated type that will vary depending on the runtime type of I value. So this is a, a runtime polymorphism based on some tag, but then this is a compile time polymorphism where we are generating a new version of this closure for every possible type of the array, which means any code we do inside here doesn't need to have some, some runtime dispatch on the type because it's known in compile time. Each version of the closure only needs to know how to handle one type of array. So we can symbolically manipulate the type saying, here, here's the type of array we're working with. And then we can use, um, was it dependent types? Basically the array knows its own data type and it knows how wide it is. So for all fixed width types, this is sufficient. Um, this code handles every fixed width type saying how much space it will take to replicate the back element n times. And of course we can handle special cases. Um, we can have an I value array of I values because you can have nested data. You can have an array of arrays or array of objects. And in that case, you actually need to check the runtime byte size of the last element. But you only pay the overhead of this, you actually don't pay this, the overhead of this check at runtime for anything except the actual um, dynamic I value. All your homogeneous cases, this just compiles away and all you have to do is uh, return this constant size of. Does that make sense? So you can write generic code that is high performance and pretty concise. This is one way we dispatch across types. There are some more interesting mechanisms. Like for casting, we have a dynamic input type and then a constant output type determined by the query. Um, so we can uh, do a lookup in a 2D array of function pointers saying, what's our implementation of our cast from type A to type B? Uh, we can likewise do interesting like const, express, const expression stuff to analyze properties of a given type and do that all at compile time within one of these overloads. So we can, for instance, get a const expression constant saying like, is this type numeric? Um, and then branch on that at a, in a compile time way. Um, and all of these can be vectorized so that we can hoist out all dispatching logic out of the inner loop. So our inner loop is fast and all of the overheads amortize away for homogeneous types. It might be a bit esoteric. So are you, are you sort of doing like the vector wise approach where you have a bunch of these primitives and you're just sort of stitching them together at, at runtime for the query plan? And assuming that the, the compiler is going to vectorize everything for you. Yes, we definitely rely on vectorization over JIT. We've considered JIT, but haven't done it yet. 
um, we find that we can get a lot of the same advantages without a lot of the complexity. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? I'm asking something deeper. I, 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 yeah, but I think you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that answers my question. Yes. Okay. Then we also. Uh, this is this is Adam, one of Andy's students here at CMU. Is there a an a uh, uh, sort of inflection point where there's a trade-off between all this template specialization and compile time? Um, putting pressure on like the instruction cache as opposed to doing dynamic dispatch at runtime? That's an excellent question. Um, we don't have a huge amount of data to, to justify this, but in practice, it has not seemed to blow up our instruction cache in a way that doesn't scale. Um, it's possible that's in part because a relatively small subset of those 16 types are actually hot. So we can fit all the, the relevant code into our instruction cache. But there is a trade-off in terms of how much code you put inside this closure that you're going to um, replicate n ways versus how much um, there's a there's a trade-off between how much code you want to generate and how many branches you want to waste out of that loop. Makes One sense. way we can deal with this, we can also do partial specializations where we can say, I know that this function is actually only supported for types X, Y, and Z, only generate the inner loop um, for types X, Y, and Z to eliminate some of that load. Uh, well, Nevin, you have a question? Yeah, hi. I'm wondering um, what effect like uh, your approach has on compilation and build times. <laughs> That's a good question, and it's it what it's what you expect. Um, our builds are fairly slow. We have a distributed build system, and thanks to the distributed build system, we can get a full build in like four minutes. Um, but without that, I think it's something around 25 minutes locally to build our entire C++ backend. It's tolerable, but yeah, you pay a price for this. All right, any other questions? Okay. Um, so in addition to performance challenges, there are also semantic questions around what happens when you do SQL on a dynamically typed system. For instance, does the integer one equal the float 1.0? Um, there are a few behaviors you could have here. You could say like, yeah, they're equal. They aren't equal, or it's a runtime error. You can't do comparison between unequal types and you're going to have to cast one side or the other. We decided it makes the most sense to say that these are equal. This is what Postgres does. Postgres allows implicit conversion here. Um, some more pra pragmatic reasons. If you just say this is false, you'll get really weird behavior when a user says like, oh, select star from my table where x equals one. If their column is a float, but they thought it was int, they're just going to get no results, no error, no nothing else. So really true or runtime error are the only valid options. And runtime error just makes querying more cumbersome and being non-Postgres compatible is a pain. So that one's pretty easy. Um, what about 0 equals 0 0.25? Um, do you cast one side to the other side? Do you, um, do you like do an implicit version? Do you do some exact arithmetic thing? Um, so what we decide here is they're, they're not equal, once again, consistent with post. post well, consistent with Postgres, consistent with mathematics, and generally produces intuitive behavior for queries. Now things get interesting. Does the double 2 to the 62 equal the integer 2 to the 62 plus 1? Oh, I'm, I'm just really curious about that right now. That's definitely not a typo on the slides. Um, this is interesting because of the representation of 64-bit floating point. If you do what Postgres does, uh, and just convert both sides to, wait a minute, we'll get this right, uh, convert both sides to double, this integer will actually round to the nearest 53 bits of precision and will round to 2 to the 62. And Postgres will tell you, yeah, these two numbers are equal. Rockset doesn't do that. And there are very good reasons not to do that. Mostly that it violates the transitive property. If you say, these, if you say that the double 2 to the 64 or 2 to the 62 is equal to the integer 2 to the 62 plus 1, you also have to say it's equal to the number 2 to the 62 minus 1. But 2 to the 62 minus 1 is definitely not equal to 2 to the 62 plus 1 if they're both integers. Like those are 64-bit integers that have different bits. Um, violating the transitive property isn't a huge problem with Postgres because you're not often doing uh, set-style transitive operations with mixed types in Postgres. It's, it's pretty much impossible to do. I would argue even in Postgres's case, it's kind of unintuitive that equality is not transitive. I have an example here where A is equal to B. Um, let's see. 
Actually, I think you need a third one to show that it's not transitive. But basically, you construct three things where A equals B, B equals C, A is not equal to C. The reason Roxet cares so much about the transitive property is that you can have a, a group by or a join on mixed types. And you need to do something sane. Um, and kind of the only sane thing you can do is use exact mathematical equality even across different into, uh, numeric types. If you were to convert everything to int, if you have floats that round to the same or truncate to the same integer, they would go into the same group by bucket and you would get wrong results. If you convert everything in the group by to float, um, then ints out of the range of negative two to the 53 to positive two to the 53 would truncate to the nearest float and you get wrong results. Um, runtime errors is an option, basically saying you can't mix both of these types in a join or group by, but that could cause really confusing behavior. Like you write one new document to your system and all of a sudden all your queries are failing. Or um, there's also the fact that since we're doing distributed joins and distributed aggregations, actually determining if it is mixed can be difficult because you have to get that, like you, you hash scatter your, your grouping key and then you have to figure out, coordinate between those nodes so they all know like, oh, I got some floats, I got some ints. Um, is this actually a mixed type operation? So we decided to use exact mathematical equality, basically like the number that is being represented by the, the bits in this double, which is going to be like a one shift over however many places, um, to manipulate instant floats. How Any often? Do, how often do anybody does anybody actually hit this issue? Like, I mean, I mean, you have you have the telemetry of, you have all the queries you've ever executed. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you keep track of them. But like, if anybody ever complained that like my query on Postgres got me this, and I'm getting a different answer on rock set, or is it analytics and therefore it's a huge wash because nobody would know what the exact number is anyway? For so there queries. are subsets of the semantics we've discussed here that we did come to because uh, customers care. For instance, the case I was talking about um, where like you search for select star where x equals one and you have x equals 1.0. If you try to return false, users will get angry. They get really confused. Yeah, that, that 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 one's obvious, sure, yes. But I'm saying like this, like this this you know when you when you when you differentiate yourself or you're you're doing something different than what Postgres said, you're going based on the math, mathematical quality. I can't imagine anybody would would notice that. It's rare. Um, it's very rare for people to actually do it. But like if you pick the wrong thing here, you're going to be giving wrong results in some subset of cases. Sure, but it's like it's like I'm like how does this? You're not doing approximate queries, right? But it, like at a certain scale, would anybody actually even notice? Like when I'm asking, did anybody say anything before you actually implemented it this way, or did you just say we're going to implement it this way first, and then it just it has worked out since then? In the case of how we're doing implicit conversion between instant float, no, I don't think that was driven by a user complaint. Okay. I think we just decided we wanted an internally consistent system, and this was the way to get reasonable semantics. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but all of these rules I'm describing actually apply similarly to dates, date times, and timestamps. And there, users do care a lot um, and sometimes do fuzzy things where like they want to like select something based on a date constant, but they want exact conversion to timestamp. Um, very similar rules. And yeah, if you if you don't allow implicit conversion or if you have implicit conversion with unintuitive semantics, people will complain. Uh, so how do we actually do this? Uh, for equality, we figure out which domain we can perform the, the equality in safely and then convert both sides to that domain. So small numbers will both go to double, large numbers will both go to int, um, and you can guarantee that you, will, you can go to at least one of the domains without rounding. Um, inequality, less than, greater than, we follow the same mathematical exact rules. Um, it's a little, little more complicated, but similar general flavor as equality. Uh, for hashing, we need to be able to do like hash scatter and hash table operations while treating one and 1.0 as equal. So basically for any double that can be exactly converted to an int, we do convert it to an int before hashing. And this is a check you can do very quickly. We chose to have this check on the double path rather than the int path. We could have converted ints to doubles when they're convertible, um, but we thought a small performance penalty on the double path would be better than on the int path since um, aggregating and joining on ints is more common. And all of these rules apply analogously for temporal types, which are also comparable and can be grouped together. I'm assuming you don't support UDTs, but at some point you may need to. So how, like, 
I guess in addition to be able to say, you know, if something does, does one UDT equal another UDT within, like, within the same value domain, now they potentially have to provide all these casting rules as well. Yeah, user defined types would get very interesting, definitely. Um, yeah. I don't think we have any plans for them right now. Um, I mean, JSON is sort of yeah. you halfway there. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can have nested objects and decide on semantics for like the keys of those objects. And we have user defined functions. You can write in JavaScript. So you could just have your user defined type as like an object. And then anything you want to do, instead of using the built in equality, you write your own UDF. And you could probably get almost all the same behavior. Got it. Thanks. All right, now I'm going to move on to indexing. How does Rockset index everything? Uh, we, yeah. So we index everything, including nested data inside arrays and objects. I feel like it's easier to understand how that works with an example. Say that you have some data set with contact information for people. Um, you have nested data where you have an object inside a top level field. Um, and you also have arrays. You have a, a contact info which contains a, an, array of, uh, an array of phone numbers. So how do we index these phone numbers for fast retrieval? The format of our index looks a lot like a, a map from the field name, which can potentially be nested if you have multiple levels of fields, like name.first means the field first inside the name top level field. Field name, the value we're indexing on, so that's going to be the, the value and the key value pair here. And then the set of matches. And these matches will be documents and potentially the indexes within the arrays where it appears within a document. So a, a location within a document. Um, so this index is a lot like what a, a more traditional database index. You just have a list of matches for this particular value. But then we also index uh, data inside of arrays. And the way we do that is the path will contain both the, the field names, contact info dot phone numbers, but then also some representation to say like, okay, now we're going inside of an array. Um, and notice it's star here rather than any particular index. I can dive in a little more in a minute on why that is star, why we index every position in an array the same way. And then you have the value and you have a list of matches for that value. So if I wanna say like, find me all, uh, all users that have a phone number equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, you just look at the posting list for the, the field path of that array, the, the value you're looking for, and then read off the list. You can even intersect these indexes. So if you want to look for a user with a particular phone number, um, that's what we're using array contains for here, saying this array has a value we're looking for um, and has these other properties, we get multiple lists uh, in our index, we intersect them in an efficient way, and then we have a final list of documents that we can look up. So we could have alternatively done this where instead of having a star here, we index at a specific position, but words like uh, contact info dot phone numbers dot one dot eight six seven five three zero nine, and then map that to a specific document ID. But that makes array contains expensive because now you need to look up every potential position in every document, which is O of the length of the longest document. Um, the trade-off here is that if you have a, a lookup where you're looking for a phone number at a specific index, B equals this value, you have to look at the wildcard index and then filter out the ones that match the correct position. We thought this was the better trade-off um, because if you want the other behavior, all you have to do is convert your phone numbers array into a phone numbers object and have fields called like one, two, three, four, five, and you can get the other behavior. Um, and this is also more sensible default because generally the performance penalty involved with um, sorting with basically finding all matches at any position and then filtering for just the position you care about is relatively small versus the performance penalty for looking up an index for every single array position would be quite large. This basically means if you delete this record, this document, then you gotta like reverse and delete everything. Um, I'll get into how we handle updates later. Um, updates to this index structure are actually quite cheap. Okay. Uh, we use a, I'll, I'll go into more detail later. Yeah, but you would have to update everything, all the indexes for everything later. Got it, thanks. Let's see. So I said that we can intersect multiple indexes at once. Um, we have an interesting way of doing this. So you essentially treat in each index like an iterator, um, maintain a pointer on each of them, and then you advance them progressively at, until you find matches. 
So let's say we first advance this first iterator named our first dot Jenny, and we say advance this iterator uh, to the first position greater than or equal to doc 42, which is the first match we found um, on the greatest of the three iterators. We can advance to the greatest of the three iterators because we know we're not going to find any match before doc 42 because this list doesn't have anything before doc 42. Um, and these iterators support both a, a sequential next API and a seek to location API that's, that's logarithmic. Okay, so we advance our second iterator, find a match. We advance our third iterator and immediately find a match. We have a match on all three iterators, so we emit that to the output. Um, once we emit this document to the output, we can look up in the row store to find the rest of the fields corresponding to this document. There was a question I kind of glossed over here. How do we decide to advance the name.first iterator before we advance the state iterator? Um, in this case, it doesn't matter too much since we find the match immediately. But if we have really long iterators where some are sparse and some are dense, getting this right matters. You want to intersect the smallest lists first. And only once you get a match in the smaller lists, you advance the larger lists. Otherwise, you could do a lot of work intersecting two dense lists, only to find you could have skipped a million spots ahead if you didn't skip to advance in a different list first. The way we do this is every few thousand times we advance, we um, look at how long we're skipping with each uh, seek operation and each next operation, and we estimate dynamically how dense each list is. And then we decide, okay, whichever ones are sparsest, according to our estimates, we'll intersect those first. And only once the sparse ones match, then we'll advance the next dense ones. Um, this means that it is correct and robust even to complicated distributions that change over the course of the doc ID space. These docs are assigned sequentially. So if you have changing distributions over time, um, it will adapt as you advance and say like, oh, this thing became very sparse in this time domain. Um, so now we can use it to more efficiently skip the other indexes. Making sense? So another nice thing that falls out of indexing data in arrays, you get text search for free. If you tokenized your data at ingest time, which Rockset provides tools for, um, and turn basically each word into, and turn your, your string into an array of word tokens, you can now use array contains or our specialized text search syntax um, to perform text search on this, this token list. Um, because basically you can say like, oh, array contains each of these three words I want, and I want them to be in this proximity. We have syntax for that. Um, and now you have fast index text search. So the type of index I've discussed so far is our simple inverted index. So you go from a value to the set of documents with that value. The invert index, index can be used to serve range queries, but it's not as efficient as it could be. If you just have the inverted index and you have a, a range query of saying like, get me everything where X is less than 20, you're going to, have to look up a lot of distinct iterators in the inverted index, and then you're going to, have to merge them all together before you can intersect them with any other predicate. Um, that merging process gets expensive if you're talking about hundreds or thousands of individual inverted index entries. Um, so we also build a multi-level range index where we take different fixed ranges of integers, timestamps, date times, um, those sort of ordered types, and we group them. We say, for everything between values of 0 and 15, um, give me all the docs that match. And likewise, we do this at, at multiple granularities. I think 2 to the 4, 2 to the 8, and 2 to the 16, 2 to the 12. Um, we do it at multiple granularities so that any range in, in so the most ranges can be constructed out of a small set of iterators that can be cheaply used together. Uh, Chi, what, what is your question? Yeah, so I'm curious, how do you know the data range in advance? So basically integer has, for example, zero to, um, to, to 32, this, this big range. So um, how do you know the user's data range in advance to um, construct such um, index? We don't know the distribution in advance. We use a, a fixed set of rules where basically smaller numbers get indexed in smaller ranges, and then um, it, it sort of scales exponentially so that if a number is like less than two to the eight, then we index it at the two to the four and two to the eight and two to the 12 granularity. If it's greater than two to the eight, then it gets like, it goes in the two to the eight size buckets, um, the two to the 12 size buckets, so some kind of rules like that. I think I'm forgetting the exact powers, but basically the further you are from the origin, the wider the buckets are in yeah. such a way that um, for the vast majority of ranges, you can construct them out of a small number of these static sub ranges. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. 
Um, I think this technique is called a static range tree as opposed to a dynamic range tree um, where you'd move these boundaries around based on the data distribution, which can get better performance in some cases. Okay, any other questions? Um, so in this case, you would construct this by uniting together the zero to 15 range, as well as the individual inverted index iterators for 16, 17, 18, and 19. Um, so you'll use a few individual iterators at the end of the year range, and then a, a series of ranges to capture the bulk of the middle. So Roxa has three storage formats. I've been talking about the index store, the, the inverted index and range indexes. Um, that the index store produces these doc IDs, which will then look up in the row store to retrieve the rest of the document. And when I say like doc one here, it really is just the, the locator that we're sharing here, none of the fields inside the document. Um, so we use the row store to look up the rest of the data. The column store is a columnar format for fast bulk scans that get all the, all the traditional advantages of a columnar store, good compression, um, good throughput when you only need some subset of columns, all of that. Are these three, I mean, Copies. This is all still. Does, everything's in RocksDB. Yes. Yes. RocksDB is the underlying storage engine for all three of these stores. Got it. Okay. So indexing everything seems like it would be expensive. It seems like it would take a lot of compute, and to a certain extent, it does. But there's two things that we do that mitigate this a lot. One is that our storage engine is a log structured merge tree, which means that all of our writes are sequential, even if we're updating a bunch of different indexes. The pattern on disk is at the, the original time when you write it, you're writing one sequential series of files, and then compaction will merge those into lower layers of the tree in the background. If you were to try to build an index on every single column in like a B-tree oriented database, the amount of fan out you would get to your disk would be pretty insane. Like the number of different point writes you would have to do to ingest a single document. That's not an issue with an LSM tree because all writes are sequential. We also use merge operand to reduce the cost of indexes and mutability. Say you have uh, an, an index where you have a list of a million doc IDs uh, for a particular value, and then you add one new document with that value. You don't want to read in that index of a million elements long, uh, add one value, and then write it back. That will tremendously increase the cost of, of ingest. Instead, what we do is we write a delta representing, I added this one document to this index. And then when compaction comes along, um, to merge layers of the LSM tree, it will combine those deltas and amortize away many deltas um, in one read, modify, write operation. And it, it, to be clear, this is this is a separate code path or separate operation than the like the traditional what are compaction in, in RocksDB. Yeah, what RocksDB gives you the primitive is a merge operator, basically you can define custom semantics that you plug into RocksDB, saying it gives you it tells you the key it's operating on. And then you will define the semantics for how to merge two keys, two values for that key. Got it. Okay. Um, indexes also usually take a lot of space to store. How does Rockset deal with that? We have disaggregated storage where we um, have separate, independently scaled tiers of, of compute nodes and storage nodes, storage nodes having big SSDs and not very many processors, compute nodes having a small local SSD for a cache and uh, very fast processors. This independent scaling can somewhat mitigate the cost of having more data in storage because that storage, when it's cold, can be a little further away and a little cheaper. There's also the fact that flash storage has generally been getting uh, cheaper, faster than compute has. So making this trade-off where you store more data in, um, in exchange for using less computed query time and faster queries is often favorable from a, a total cost perspective. There's also the advantage of less human cost for configuring indexes um, since you get them all by default. When you say roughly a, a percentage across the entire fleet of box set, like what is the percentage of data that goes off the, the S3? Um, so the, the two storage tiers, all of the data is still in um, flash storage, but it's in flash storage that's attached to very little compute so that we pay lower, less per gigabyte. Got it. And so, so what percentage of that? Actually, one is why not jump to S3? And then two, what percentage of it of, of the, again, the entire data set that Rockset manages is on this cheaper storage? Um, so all of the data in Rockset is on the disaggregated storage tier. 
but some of it also lives in the local cache. Um, it's an inclusive cache. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think about what percentage of our total data set fits in this cache. I would have to look at numbers to get something exact, but I think it's gonna be something on the order of 10 or 15% maybe. Okay, so there's basically, there's S3, and then there's like a cold cache, and then there's a hot cache. There's a, yes. There's a three tier. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, we actually never want queries going directly to S3, at least today. Um, S3 just has a latency that's too long to serve queries from. Like a single get could take 100 or 200 milliseconds. Um, and if you're doing an index lookup, every single one of those documents is going to turn into a different random access. Yep. Okay. We use S3 for persistence, though, uh, for, for durability, to guarantee that like, even if our storage tier goes down, the data is still there. We don't want to be serving queries from it. All right, I said I was going to talk a little more about how we do writes. Um, so I was talking about merge operands. How do we store a delta for an individual write on an already very large index? So we have a new insert um, that basically will go into this inverted list. It's already very long. Rather than reading the whole thing and writing it back, we store a merge operand. So now we have two values for the same key, which RocksDB allows. And at read time, we can basically treat them both as iterators and do the same thing we did for intersection, but now we're doing a union where we emit a result when either of the iterators matches. Um, and then once compaction comes along to merge these back together, uh, we will end up with one longer list and we don't need to pay the cost of the streaming merge anymore. But by the time compaction comes along, we'll probably have seen several more updates to this index. So instead of doing a read modify write for a single entry out of a million, it might be a read modify write for a thousand updates out of a million. So to sum up, um, the advantage of this dynamic type system. Oh, uh, Chi, do you have a question? Yeah, so I have a question on this page, right? So um, I can think of a way to um, encode those keys so that you don't need to do merge or print. Like, uh, can you encode a key like state dot active dot doc one, state dot active dot doc two? Yeah, so you're actually describing an earlier version of our index. Um, where actually we had a single key value pair in RocksDB for every single match in the index. The issue with that is that a RocksDB key value is a pretty heavyweight concept, both in terms of storage and compute. You've got uh, several bytes of overhead for the key, um, and a RocksDB next is fairly expensive. I think it's going to be something on the order of maybe 100 microseconds, 10 microseconds, versus we really would rather be able to grab these matches just like iterating over an array of 8-byte integers. Um, which we're talking about like a, a nanosecond or a fraction of a nanosecond. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, we essentially, it, this is actually a simplified picture. We actually group these into ranges where every 64K range of docs is one RocksDB key value pair. And then you'll have like the next key value pair for the next set of the range. So this would actually be um, not a million RocksDB key values, but maybe um, what, a, a thousand, a few hundred? All right, so since Roxa has a dynamic typing system and a schema list, it can ingest data from anywhere. Um, its expressivity is a superset of most other databases you'll see. Um, so you can take data from DynamoDB, MongoDB, JSON, CSV sitting in S3, whatever you want. It indexes everything so you can get fast queries without manually configuring indexes and figuring out the, the right database configuration for your workload. Um, it has is real time for data so that since the indexes are immutable and the column store and row store are both are also immutable, um, you can do a write and it'll be visible to queries within seconds. No batch processing. Every delta is, is visible as soon as it's written. Um, we also have fast queries on columnar data. You can use our vectorized execution engine um, and, and columnar format to do fast scans. And for anything search based, you can use indexes on every field that's present in the predicates of your query. All right. Do people have any other questions? I'll, I'll applaud it back to everyone else. Uh, before I'm gonna rip um, open it to the, to the floor, if, if anybody has a question for Ben, please unmute yourself and go for it. Okay, awesome, I'll use the time. Through you guys. Uh, so my first question is, how large are the blocks in, in the column store? Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's configure old, I think our default today is 4096. So configure old by you or by the user? By us, by us. Got it, okay. And, 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 and under what conditions do you guys change it? Very rarely, 4096 works well on pretty much all workloads I've seen. Going beyond that, like you've already amortized away the cost of dynamic dispatch. Um, yeah, I, I haven't needed to configure it in practice. 4096 is a good value. Got it, okay. And then I guess my, my only other question is more of a philosophical one that, you know, there's basically two ways to speed up analytical queries. There's the approach you guys are taking where you just index everything and anything. Um, and then there's the, the other approach where you materialize views, where you try to pre-join things ahead of time. Um, and so maybe the rocks that customers are self-selecting that they're doing a bunch of queries that don't do join, but all this indexing at the end of the day may not actually help. Uh, I mean, it helps with joins because you don't have to build the hash table, right? I guess maybe that's what I'm getting. It's like, in, under what conditions would the index everything approach not work as well as materialized views that could potentially pre-join things? Mm, yeah, so... Um... Indexes only help for joins if the join is very selective. Basically, you're only going to need to retrieve a very small fraction of the data on one side of the join. And by small, I mean like less than 1%, less than a tenth of a percent. Um, because as soon as you're using indexes, you're doing random access. And random access either in memory or on disk is going to be like quite slow. Even like really fast SSDs today, like what you can get on um, NVMe SSD EC2 instances, you're talking like 12,000 IOPS per core, somewhere in that domain which is just nowhere near as many tuples as you can scan sequentially. Um, so yeah, if you're doing a join where like you're only selecting one in a million rows from one side, using an index join, which we support, will be really, really fast. If you're using getting 10%, you're probably going to want a hash join, which we also support. Does that answer the question? And uh, I'm thinking about the numbers, sorry. You're saying, so anything less than 1%, your index join works. Um, Anything greater than that, then you want to use a hash join? Yeah, the threshold is going to be somewhere between like a, a percent and a tenth of a percent. Um, we're indexing only wins when you're very, very narrow, narrowly selected. Okay, and, and this, this is the difference between random access versus sequential access, because like the hash join is essentially building a, its own index, right? It's building a, an ephemeral data structure to do the join. But you're saying that like the... But if the if the index is based on the, sorry if the join predicate is based on the index, then you're gold, right? Um, well, the index access will be sequential, but looking at the other fields of the document from the row store will be a random access. I, again, that, that's if the um, how does this like you still have to do that for the hash join anyway. I guess if you tuck the whole tuple in, in, the, in, the, in the hash tuple, then you get that. Okay. Yeah, it's an in-memory okay. random access. Got it, got it. Okay, okay. And um, even then, I think you can pipeline that that shuffle operation in ways in memory that would be harder to do with an index join. Okay. Do you guys support distributed execution? Like like one query touches multiple uh, compute nodes? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, every query can can shard out. Um, joins are distributed, aggregations are distributed, uh, scans and indexed operations are distributed. Okay, so if it is the case that anything less than, if you, if you guys believe that anything less than 1% uh, selectivity in a join is better served by a hash join, wouldn't that argue that potentially materialized views would be, would be better, right, to be able to support that? And I guess my, my, it leads back to my original premise of the question of like, are people choosing rock set because they don't have heavy joins uh, in their workloads? So they're going and grabbing single documents. Is that sort of the real time analytical workload you guys are trying to, guys are trying to support? Um, I definitely do see customers using rock set with, with very join heavy workloads. Uh, we perform well. I'm trying to think. We don't have materialized view of the joins. We have rollups, which are materialized aggregations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in yeah. some cases, those can yield similar advantages. Got it. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, you guys are also running on like, to your point, like the if everything's hot in the cache, uh, you know, sitting on attached storage. So again, you're not pulling from S3 for these things. 
Um, mm. All right, cool. Um, all right, sorry, audience, any other questions? Thank <laughs> you.